Do you know how to improve your content on your website to increase your RPMs and earn more money? And do you have a plan for when the cookie update rolls out, third-party cookies no longer exist on how and where you're actually gonna get your ad revenue from? Hi, I'm Jerry Krause, host of the Buying Online Business Podcast, and today I'm speaking with Paul Bannister, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at AdThrive. In his role, he leads the programmatic sales and video monetization teams that create compelling media experiences that connect the world's largest brands with the company's nearly 4,000 independent publishers. Now, before joining AdThrive, which is also Cafe Media, he founded an online gaming review site, which we talk about, and he sold, which is one of the first websites that was dedicated to computer games. Uh, He's also authored two books on computer games and has held roles at US Web, also Amatide and CMP Media. Now he serves on the board of the IAB Tech Lab and is actively involved in the W3C and pre-bid communities that are driving the future of advertising and why he knows so much about third-party cookies and where we're heading with that, which we talk about in the episode I'm going to mention very shortly. But we talk about throughout the episode, the first thing we talk about is how to become an attractive publisher, how to have an attractive blog uh, to advertise on and be a publisher that bigger media buyers and ad networks actually want to work with, want to partner with, which is important. You're a partner with these ad networks and you're a partner with these media buyers and how do you become an attractive buyer? We also talk about what entails um, in the steps that you can take to take your content from just regular content to having amazing content that is trustworthy, serves people, and allows you to build your brand so you have a really highly engaged audience, which is what ad networks and media buyers actually want. We also talk about how to increase your RPM once you have partnered with an ad network. Then we move on to third-party cookies. What are third-party cookies? How do they evolve? How have they been used over the last 30 years? And what do they mean for bloggers? Why they've been so critical for us in how we make money from our websites for those last 30 years? And what are some of the solutions to the landscape of owning a blog and trying to earn ad revenue when the third-party cookie update rolls out and the third-party cookie no longer exists. So this is such a juicy podcast episode. You guys are absolutely going to love it. Also note that this podcast is not the only way that I can help you for free. If you're looking at buying a site, make sure you get my due diligence framework. It's on buyingonlinebusiness.com forward slash free resources. And there's some other awesome case studies and resources that you can get on that page too. So check that out. Paul, hello, and welcome to the Buying Online Businesses podcast. Hey, Jared, great to be here. A lot of people listening will know what AdThrive is. Not so many people will know what Cafe Media is. And I I was confused as well. I was like, hang on, what's, you know, you're from Cafe Media, but you're also at this AdThrive. Is there a difference between Cafe Media or AdThrive at all? And what's the, what's the, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, it's a great question. Comes up a lot. Um, AdThrive and Cafe Media are the same company. AdThrive and Cafe Media merged five years ago. So it's been a while now. And at the time, and it's still true, we sort of realized that AdThrive has a very strong brand with publishers and we didn't want to mess around with that. And Cafe Media has a very strong brand with advertisers and we didn't want to mess around with that. So while I think at some point we might we're almost definitely going to want to like figure out a way to like come under the same name, uh, they are the same company. It's just a matter of generally a little bit who we're who we're talking to. So if I go to an advertiser meeting, we're Cafe Media. Yeah. If I go to a publisher meeting, we're AdThrive. But otherwise, other than that, there's no difference. Cool. So it's about basically a way to keep the same brand for each of your clients. <laughs> really? It, 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 exactly. And it's just about, you know, we want publishers to know we make them the most money. And AdThrive has, has, I think, stood well for that sort of, you know, basic message. Mm-hmm. And we want advertisers to know we bring them the best quality sites and the best quality the best you know kinds of ads and the best performance of their ad campaigns and those sort of things and and those messages are important and and the names are well associated with those messages so it's uh you know keep, keeping that consistency important now i asked you a question before we hit the record buttons about buying and selling sites and you did mention that you built a site back in the 90s and you sold it i'm so curious like you said it's a long time ago and i'm like where where did you how did you sell it where did you sell it i've been on the web since like the very early days like before like before like netscape existed and like the very 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 old web browsers like even like text web browsers and so i started a video game website back in 95 we were we were one of the first websites on the internet to run ads 
So it was like that, mm. like that ancient of a, of a history in time. Yeah. There's no affiliate business model. That's like none of these business models. That almost exist today 30 years ago. Bought it, yeah. Uh, you're dating me, but, but something like that. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so a long time ago. And so we started running ads. We started attracting an audience. Um, it was kind of, it was Google didn't exist. It was other earlier search, search, search engines that were kind of harder to optimize for. We built an audience and, you know, became one of the, the bigger video game websites on, on the web. And at, at that point, it, it, you know, interesting piece of history, magazines and newspapers and TV stations and things like traditional media weren't on the web and wanted yeah. to get there. So some were building websites and others were buying websites. So we happened to be in the right place at the right time and met the publisher of a, of a print magazine who needed a website. And we said, and you know, we had a conversation and said, hey, let's be the website for, for your magazine. So it ended up being a really interesting thing, but there were no, the, the model of how today people buy and sell websites and the, the systems and the tools and platforms that exist for that sort of thing, like didn't exist. It was all just conversations and, and finding people. Finding people, word of mouth, knowing people, networking, which is great. I, I'm all about the networking. I think it's great to be connected by the internet these days, but the networking is, I mean, you can network, but that's not exactly the same. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Oh, well, congratulations on, on selling that. That's really cool. Uh, I'm sure you learn. <laughs> a lot from that experience. What was that process like back then? Was it like, all right, we want to have a look at the site. We want to have a look how many people are coming to the site. Yeah. What, what was a part of their due diligence really? Was the site making money? The site was making money, although very, very little. Like I was doing it with a couple of other, I, I was, I founded it. A couple of people were helping me. I was paying them like an hourly, you know, rate or even a per article rate to write things. We were making some money, but it was in my parents' basement. And to some level, like, like I didn't want to, I maybe had grander aspirations, but it was so early that like, like I didn't even know. And I was like, wow, I can be a part of a bigger company and do this. Like, this sounds great. Like yeah. selling as a relative term, it was more like they gave me a job and took my website off my hands so or the pushing <laughs> costs and stuff anymore. So, so it was more that kind of thing, but it was just, it was still very interesting. And, and, you know, there wasn't really much due diligence to be done because the reason they found me is they knew from their editors and their team, they were like, this website's really good and people go yeah. here and this is a really active site. Like we should check this out. So like, they had internally the knowledge they needed to make a choice and you know their risk was low because they were mainly like should we employ this guy or not and you know that worked out okay so and so i guess that sounded like from where you were at in your life then that was the kind of the start of your career like actual career path. exactly 100 percent. yeah and, and it was the beginning of me being really interested in like kind of like where content and advertising meet because mm. we were doing we were creating lots of content we were writing articles we were getting stuff out into the world and and audiences were showing up and we were also you know making money from ads and it was long before programmatic ads it was long before ad servers we had to build an ad server because they didn't exist and, and it was you know you had to build everything yourself it was um it was a great way to get started and, and really what introduced me to the whole idea of how all this stuff works you're in the business of and this is what like you've have been for a long long time now most like your whole career is is yeah. and that's what ad thrive is as well is is getting publishers not to publishers, just media companies and people who want to advertise and media buyers in front of an audience and their correct audience, right? So, you, so matching them up, which is which is what Ad Thrive does. But we also talked before we hit the hit the record buttons about most bloggers are like, how do I just make as much money as possible for me? And that's one that's only like half of the pie or one piece of the puzzle, right? It's not just about it's not just about the blogger. It's not just about us as a content site owner. There's somebody else that you're in a part, basically in a partnership with, which is an advertiser. So what are some of the, mm -hmm. what are some of the things bloggers should be aware of or should be doing to, to be able to set themselves up to have it and be a really awesome partner, I guess, for these, for these advertisers. Yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. I think it's, it's exactly what I think a lot of people should be thinking about. I think ultimately bloggers, publishers, creators of any sort are interested in you know, making money from what they do and what they own. And yeah, it's absolutely, that makes sense. On the other side of the, the kind of value exchange is the advertiser who wants to reach engaged, you know, audiences who wants to run ad campaigns that deliver performance, you know, simplistically from their perspective, they want to spend a dollar and make $2. And so they want to make sure that where they're spending their money is effectively driving their own ROI and their own performance. And so I think if you if you have that mindset as a publisher, I think it makes it easier to think about what the outcomes are going to be, because I think it, it helps sharpen your thinking about like where you should focus. And it is about 
building engaged audiences and having, you know, really good quality traffic. And it's about like an engagement of that audience. I think if you have, if it's, if people are disengaged, but they're like, that's okay. Uh, it can be okay. But if people come and they really, and they're coming back and they're spending time, I'm like, that's really how, when that user likes your site, yeah. that's when an advertiser is probably going to like your site the most too. So it's not that it's not about volume because I'm sure volume is still sure. a thing, but also before volume would come the level of engagement in that niche uh, industry that your audience is in or you are in. So yep. would that would that be correct? Like, I mean, you, you obviously want to not just be like, hey, you've got like five people coming to your site a day, <laughs> but mm -hmm. they're super quality people with money that want to buy the products right. that we might be advertising on the site. Like that's not really, it's a hard, harder one, one to scale, right? So you want volume, right. but more importantly, it would be the, the combination of audience, engage audience first and then volume as well of that. So what are some of the things people should be thinking about and doing or even within and writing their content to get more engagement? And is it engagement within that email list and sending people back to the site or is it engagement through comments and how do we generate more uh, what they call the, the, the buzzword is um, user generated content. <laughs> how do we how do we create more of that engagement with our with our content as a as a content side? It's a great question, and I think you, you can look at like the really big media companies as kind of a good parallel. Like how did how does like PC Magazine or some like big like yeah. tech magazine or something? It's got a, and they've got a really big website um, or CNET or somebody that's, that's you know digital only. Like what what are and and you know that's a specific content vertical, but the same rules apply in a lot of different cases. And like, and, and for them, it's like create trusted content that people, when they get there, they're like, oh, like this answers my question. This, mm. this meets my need. Mm. Um, it has to be believable. Um, you want content that is like comprehensive. Like you, you want people to not only be like, oh, my question was answered, but actually it answered four questions I didn't even know I needed to, yeah. to, to get to yet. It can be, you know, and, and I think, you know, that's for the informational side of the world. I think you can, you want to engage and entertain people. I think you want people to feel like, oh, wow, like there's personality here. This is not just dry content. This is something where like, I like this person. I, I associate with this person. I think for sites where the, you know, you know, if, if your persona is part of the site that, you know, you've got to use your judgment, but that can be a benefit because the yeah. people who think like you will be like, oh, wow. Like, this is a person I can I can feel connected with, and I, they're believable to me. Oh yeah, that's cool. That's that's juicy. So talking about trust, and, and this is a big thing. I, I, a lot of people, and I understand where everybody's at. They come to make money online space, and they either want to start a site or or buy a site, and they don't really think about the trust thing. They're not. They don't really know to think about the long game because they're like, hey, I've got my my circumstances here, I'm, I'm in this, I've got to get, you know, I've got to do what Jared's done, get out of survival phase and earn some, earn some coin, right? Get out of my job, which I totally get. The part of that is not thinking about the long, longer picture of, and the long playing the long game of like, Hey, my content should be, people should know who the content is written by, or at least have some level of trust and put some level of authority in that content that it's like, wow, that answers my, like you said, answers my question and resonates with me. And it's not just that it answers my question, it answers it in a way that's like, yes, like I'm so empowered now I can go away and do this task that needs to be done or do these things in my life that needs to be done. And this is probably why, you know, Ad Thrive don't um, have, accept people on their platform or to use Ad Thrive if they've just got content written by, like a lot of content written by people that, are uh, not really giving the best answer. The English may not may not be the best, and it's written by you know some somebody in a undeveloped country, non English speaking first as a native language, and uh, they've got a lot of lot of that content. But that's I guess that's where the engagement lacks, right? Why pe and why people exactly. aren't thinking about how do I get to? Because a lot of people listening here will be like, cool, I've got a site, but I want it. The goal is to get to Ad Thrive, but there's so many mm -hmm. so many rungs on the ladder that they're not they're not thinking about. So that's just what I'd say. That's just one of them, right? What would some of the other rungs be for them to get themselves set up a highly engaged um, audience? I think, you know, what, one of the, it's not the only indicator, but an extremely strong indicator. And it's, it, it's so connected to all the things we're saying is like having good traffic from search because mm -hmm. Google in particular has done such a good job at this point of understanding user intent and then finding the content that matches to that. Yeah. So I think that, well, it's almost the same thing as what we're saying. Like if you're doing well at search, 
you're probably doing well at engaging the user and you're probably doing well at creating quality content that's answering questions. Because if you're not doing those things, Google's going to deprioritize you pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And so I think like that's a good, well, it, it's, it's sort of one of the same. It's a really good indicator of that. I think that's important. I do think also another thing, and again, like it's funny how much these things are all connected right now. I think social does matter, can matter also. Uh. Not that, like, I think again, if you have an engaged audience on your site and you're engaging them in comments, I think, I think that's valuable. I think if you have, you know, whatever's right for your, for your site, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever platform is, is best for you. I mean, be, be in all of them, but like, find your audience there and engage them. And that, that makes them want to come back and build more of that trust. And, and again, it's a good signal to, to Google. So it's, it, I feel like it's a lot of these things are very connected with the, those fundamental points of like really good quality content that resonates with users and answers their questions or, or entertains them in some way. And I think those are the things. And it's like, how, how do you, how do you find those people through search or social or your email or other places do that? How do you engage those people through social, through your email, through comments? And how do you just make them feel like you're somebody, you and the content that's on your site are something that's trustworthy and believable and they want to come back to it. It is, it is so much about putting yourself in the user's shoes. Like, is this mm. really good for, for your users? Uh, and if the answer is yes, that's a great indicator right there. But if the answer yeah. is like, ah, I don't feel like our content of this type is that good, or, you know, this is like, it's an investment to get to, to that level of like re really kind of, you know, building that level of authority and believability with an audience. When people come to the space, they get bogged down in the SEO of it and the metrics of it and all that sort of stuff and forget that the foundation, the baseline is in serving through your content. And when you serve through your content, then you're going to have people coming back to the site where you, you know, and this might be a metric that AdThrive uses, I'm not sure, is like where you see how many people are coming directly to the site or returning to the site and time on page and all these sorts of things. Yep. Whereas like those are the those are things like the foundation is the content and then those things will come. Don't focus on those things and how do I get there? It all leads back to the, all those roads lead back to the baseline of the content. So, and that's also exactly. the answer for getting the bigger, bigger media buyers on your site too, right? Because of the, the engaged audience. Exactly. And and, you, and and then you start thinking about it from an advertiser perspective. It's like, we work with 4,000 sites now, so advertisers aren't typically looking at all 4,000 and picking and choosing which ones they like. But people look and people think about things. And if they know, I go to a lot of meetings with advertisers and they're like, oh my God, like you work with so-and-so website. And we're like, yeah, and like, that's great. I love it. And like advertisers are real people too. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're either going to know sites or they're going to look at sites sometimes and be like, oh, this is really good. Or they're going to be like, hmm. Like that's not so great. Like that's not what I want. So I think again, if you're answering the question for how do you make your users and make your audience feel really good, you're also getting into the world of doing the same for advertisers, which is how you get the most access to the best buys and everything else. So it sounds like some of those advertisers are like, oh wow, you you have so and so on your platform. For advertisers to say that they know that website, which means that website has some level of a brand. I know that you're not like, and you would have learned a lot through seeing a lot of different sites now, but what do you see a lot of these bigger sites have in common with their branding and how they may have established that? So people can think about the long game as well, like, oh, cool, content. And then on top of the content, once we have the brand, like, well, the brand comes from, you know, trust and authority, but like, what are some yeah. of those things that you see those common uh common between those top sites or even just like a lot of the sites on your on the platform you have it's, it's funny i do I, I feel like i'm saying the same thing repeatedly but i do think <laughs> yeah. it, like i keep coming back to it because i think it's it's so important um yeah. we even yeah. have like a number of small sites that within their super small kind of niche vertical like they built a brand there and they're like believable there and they are trustworthy there i um was looking for for a, a new dishwasher recently and like one of our sites happens to have like really excellent reviews of like home appliances. And I was on it all the time. And like, mm. you know, the site, it's not huge. It's a, it's a, you know, medium sized site. Um, but within that, I'm like, Oh, the next time I'm buying an appliance, like I'm definitely going there. Cool. So I think, you know, you can do it at almost any scale or size where it does matter. It, it's about that resonance. It's about answering questions. It's about, mm. it's about making the user feel like their needs were really met. And, and then, it, and to your point, like that gets back to like how much direct traffic do you have in things? Because now like, I'll just type in the name of the site because I remember it because it's really yeah. good. Yeah, and I think yeah. that the more, right. and, and you know, that, 
sometimes it can be a little hard to achieve. Like, and I get that. Like, for every site like that, there's probably ten others that probably won't won't get there. But still, like, when users are coming back to it from from search or from other channels, if they if they really are kind of hitting those points and and serving serving the audience, I feel like that that gets to how you build a brand. Is you, is you build a repeatable, believable system that yeah. system is the wrong word, but like experience for your audience. So they're like, I know when I need X, I go to this this website. Um, so I think again, it's all sort of like this like virtuous cycle that's tied together of like that starts with the user and and like making them feel really good about what, what they need and getting it from you. Oh, so good, Paul. Thank you. I really like the word that you said, the experience. People want a repeatable experience if it was enjoyable and that I guess a publisher, a blogger can create that great experience for a user. Like traffic are people. <laughs> it's not just how much traffic do you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You should change it. Like how many people yeah. are visiting your site per day, not just how much traffic have you got? Like it takes the humanness out of it. But when we realize that, mm -hmm. you know, those are people that are coming to the site and we make our content, the answer such an enjoyable experience, that's, that's it. That's the, you know, you've, you've kicked the goal then I believe. And that's what, and that's what you're yeah. saying as well. Yeah. So then it comes to the point that, all right, exactly. we've got, we've got a, um, we know how to create a great experience through our answers and our, and our content. We know how to continue to create a bunch of that content and generate viewers and users and human beings coming to the site, not just traffic. Yep. Uh, and then, and then we go, cool. Um, we're on ad thrive. Um, let's get on ad thrive. How, what's the, what's the next step with the RPM? A lot of people like, how do I get from like a $20, RPM or more? I mean, $30 is still mm -hmm. good, still decent. People might be at 15, $15 RPM. What is, I mean, you've, I just want mm -hmm. to mention just so people know that, you know, uh, through AdThrive, there's a, I think it's made with Luau or Lua who increased mm -hmm. their RPM by 350, 350%, 351%. So you guys can definitely help people increase their RPMs. What a, like, yep, yep. what time frame was that just for people to get some context? Because people might think, okay, like that was done in like three days' time or something like that. Maybe not realistic. Uh, what time frame yep. was that? Well, what are some of the things that people can do, just like in this case study, where um, we can yep. increase those? So, so I think there's Made with Allow, um, which is a, so they're a great story. They have a big YouTube channel and their website was like a little secondary. I don't, I don't know them personally. No so wonder they've got the, the story a little bit. No, I was just going to say, sorry to interject. No wonder they've got a great audience because they've got the highly engaged yep. and trust through YouTube, which builds great yep. level of trust. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So if I remember correctly, their site was running AdSense before us because they hadn't thought about how to monetize their website. Yeah. And yeah. so when they moved to us, you know, a combination of way better ad layout and structure of pages, way more, you know, advanced types of ad units accessible. And then just all the things we do on the back end with our sales team and with our ad code and other stuff to just optimize. You know, it's on our website, the full case study to your point. But I would imagine within a matter of a couple of weeks, they went, they grew by 350%. So I think that that's, that's a, a great, and we get a lot of those stories from people coming from networks like AdSense. Um, where there's just a ton of room to grow. Mm. Um, so I think those are, those are great stories. I think for publishers who are already working with us or already working with like, you know, a higher tier ad network, there's still a lot of room for growth, um, you know, as a general point, but, but definitely when you come to our platform where there's so many things that we can tweak and optimize. And, and you know, some of those things we can do at a macro site-wide level for a publisher and um, we have a team that spends their time focused on that but then also there's a lot of things that as a publisher you can think about and do i think one of the most powerful tools we have is rpm by page so you can start seeing what are my pages and what are my experiences that are driving the highest rpms and start trying to unpack like what's happening there like what what's driving that like are users spending more time and that's driving rpm are they you know scrolling further down the page and that's driving what it is like what like and, and what it is about what is it about that content that's working best? And then what we've had a lot of publishers do over time, you know, we happily do this in concert with those who, who want to lean in here, look at those best learning pages and figure out what can we learn? And then how can we sort of apply those learnings elsewhere through, through the content, either through more things we can do on the ad side or different kinds of content or different layouts or different approaches that, that each publisher can do to really optimize. And that's what, because I think for most publishers that have a decent pool of content, I don't know the number, but I would imagine that like, if, you're, if your site-wide RPM is 
you've got a bunch of 40s and 50s and a bunch of 10s and 12s. And, you know, the question clearly is, how do I get rid of more of the 10s and 12s and get more of the 40s and 50s? Yeah. And that's a big focus of how you can really optimize optimize your site. It comes back to what I teach and what people come to me for help with in one-to-one coaching is like, how do they work out what's working on the, in their business so they can do more of that and less of the other thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess with this one, from the outside looking in, uh, it's more about those those pieces of content that are getting the 40s and 50s RPM, breaking that down, like you said, the layout, but would also be, all right, the topic is like, you know, uh, I've got a client that's um, in the dog space. Is it, is it these types of dogs this breed of dogs that is, and they're, um, they're actually moving to ad thrive. Um, we didn't see the conversations with it. Is it that type of dog, that topic that's bringing in the traffic because people that ha- own that type of dog, their intent and the love for that dog is, and this is a perception could be more than say s- the love for a dog for other breed or the type of people that own those types of dogs. Um, and they are willing to spend more money on this type of dog because of that. Would they? Would that be a thing that you look at and like, oh, maybe it is the topic and maybe it's the intent and maybe it's how much dollars that that, that particular um, user coming to the site has? Are they, they things that you look uh, at? Too? Yeah, mm. yeah I, th- I think all of that is, is exactly right. Um, it's definitely on the list. I th- there's also sometimes like strange correlations that are hard to show and prove sometimes <laughs> like yeah. owners of that kind of dog could be more affluent than the average mm. person and therefore buyers who are interested in people earning over a hundred thousand dollars a year or some mm. you know demographic group are more mm. likely to target target that side so so mm. there are sometimes things that are harder to do there's also on the on the ad buyer side there's more and more you know machine learning going into these buying systems like it's rarer for somebody to be like i'm trying to reach owners of Pomeranians and therefore I'm going to buy on these sites that have owners of Pomeranians content and whatever. Um, mm. That happens. Um, I, although even when that happens, it's more and more automated these days, but but more often than not, it is you, um, buyers taking in lots of signals and then testing campaigns, testing hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of ad campaigns against those mm. and finding like, oh, wow, if you look at people on this dog site between the hours of three and five who come from the Pacific time zone in the U.S., who, you know, are on their third page view, like they buy luxury SUVs like you wouldn't imagine. And like, <laughs> yeah. and then like all the luxury SUV campaigns will run there. And like, like none of us, you know, no humans could have figured that out. The mm. systems will figure that out and we'll find mm-hmm. like, this is a good place for me to advertise. Well, that's exciting to hear. Yeah, because I guess for us with so many other things going on in our brain, it's hard for us to conceptualize that when there's so many variants, when we've got other things mm-hmm. going on in our life. So that's-, that's- it, it, Exactly. And part of it's like, like, there are some places where it's like really worthwhile to lean in and do more and understand more about your audience. And there's also some times where you have to be like, I don't know what the answer is to this question and I'm never yeah. going to know. And that's like, I got to move on to the next thing. I'm like, let's I think, not, let's know, not tamper with it and break it. So yeah, let's, 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 let's not break what's yeah working really well. <laughs> mm-hmm, exactly. Exactly. All right. So we've covered so much around how to create a good partnership and be a better or a more attractive partner for media buyers with our content trust serving Mm -hmm. serving people and then increasing rpms once we get there some people are freaking out about cookies uh Mm third-party cookies and i get this question a lot um you know what happens when the third-party cookie you know dies off and it's removed and you know this is this is being delayed now until 2024 uh, which is good gives us time as publishers and um us to work out what's what you know What's going on? What are we going to do? Um, so I would just like to ask you this at the most, like speak to somebody who is just like a content site owner and they're like, I want to put ads on my site and they, you know, they don't know what a third party cookie is. And and so what is a third party cookie? How does it work? And then what's, what's going to happen when these are removed? And how does that relate to publishing and ads? Yep. Yep. So um, cookies in general are technology in your browser that, um, help websites understand who, a little bit about who you are and keep track of you. So to go back to my very early days of the web, before cookies, what a web you could never log into a website because from e- each page was like independent. The, the web had no memory. Like websites didn't know who you were. So the idea, you know, the engineers at that point in time was like, we need some technology that makes it so like 
sites can remember who you are at a very simple level. Mm. Um, and the technology that came out of that is called cookies. There are two kinds of cookies at a very high level. One is called first party cookies, which none of all these things that are going on in the world really affect. But a first party cookie is like when you go to dogs.com, um, I have no idea what site we're talking about, but let's, let's just use that as an example. Yeah. Um, if you log in directly to that site, with code running on that site, like it's a WordPress plugin or something like that, and it's like literally surfing that domain, that's a cookie that lives inside that domain. So dogs.com itself is tracking you as a user, and that doesn't work anywhere else. If you go to cats.com, like it doesn't know anything about you. Mm -hmm. um, Third-party cookies are cookies that are run by companies that are not the owner, not the, not, not the domain itself. So yeah. to use us as a pretty good example, if we worked with dogs.com and cats.com and adthrive.com code is running on both sites, we can use third-party cookies to say, oh, on dogs.com, this is Jared. And also, I mean, we don't know if it's Jared per se, but we know it's your cookie. And we can see that same cookie, that same third-party cookie appear on, on cats.com and be like, oh, this is the same user. That's really interesting. They own a dog and a cat. That, that's an interesting data point. So that's like simply con conceptually what it is. Technologies existed for 30, close, you know, 94, I think it came out. Okay. Um, so for a long time now. And... From the early days of it happening, people realized there were a lot of privacy issues around that. And more and more privacy is becoming a huge deal generally in the world, but also because of regulations like GDPR in Europe and CCPA in California and Colorado and Vermont and Brazil and other, like more and more you know, states and countries are implementing different privacy rules, forcing people to start saying like, how do we improve user privacy? And third-party cookies are one of like, have a, a lot of weaknesses when it comes to privacy um, yeah. because effectively any company that can run that can run code on a website can track users all over the place. It's like sort of a scary like situation. Damn. And so all of the browsers have made efforts to clean that up over time. At this point, the only browser left that doesn't turn them off by default is Chrome. Um, but Chrome is 50 to 60% of browsers out in the world. So it's, it's a big, big, big deal. And I think so simplistic. And, and then, you know, the, the, the key point is that Advertising systems have been built over the last 15 years on cookies as the core technology. And so it's like, oh, go ahead. I just, yeah, I just want to expand that, double click mm -hmm. on it, open it up, whatever you want to call it. But just so people get this, that the way, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the way that media buyers and, you know, ad networks like you guys work out what types of ads to serve to the users is by tracking the user's data, right? So just people yep. just want people want people to understand that um, because that's that's big. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. And, and, so, and there are other systems and technologies like context matters. Like if you're on a page about dogs, like serving dog ads there does make sense actually. So that that certainly happens also. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, that's exactly right. Like cookies and the tracking of users across sites is a big part of it. And, and this, the very simple example is the type of advertising called retargeting, where you go to Zappos and you put some sneakers in your shopping cart, but you don't buy them. Mm -hmm. And then two days later, you're on dogs.com and you see a Zappos ad with the exact sneakers that, that you, you wanted to buy. That's like the most traditional use of it. And there's a million more ways it's used, but that's like the basic case. And that, that, uses, that is you know, tracking at its core and mm -hmm. it uses cookies to do that. Cool. Okay. So just the easiest way to, for people to conceptualize it is that third party cookies allows almost anybody to any smart person that knows how to code to track data to be able to re re advertise or advertise to them. Um, yep. you know, in, in, with the, yeah. So now there's the removal of cookies and it's been delayed to 2024. What does that mean for people that say on your platform and maybe other ad networks where they're like, you know, this ad network uses cookies to be able to get us the best RPM because they're serving the correct users with the right ad. Boom. That's how we get a, a higher RPM. Yep. What, what, what do we do? <laughs> what do we do about that? So, so, so I, you know, I can only speak for us per se. Um, mm -hmm. All I can speak maybe for the ecosystem to some level. What we do know is that lots of companies and industry trade groups and things are building technologies to replace cookies. That's happening. And we're very actively engaged in all of that. And I can talk more about the details in a minute if you want. So all, all these companies are building different technologies. I think also it will be true that whereas today, nearly everything relies on a single technology, which is cookies. I think in the future, you know, the, the phrase that a big advertiser we work with said to me that I like a lot is that she called it like a patchwork quilt. 
it's going to be a batch of different solutions that have to be built that that fill it fill up a gap for cookies so yeah. it's not like oh we're getting rid of cookies and replacing it with cupcakes um yeah. <laughs> that's not what it's going to be it's going to be we're getting replaced we're getting rid of cookies and replacing them with these 12 things that yeah. all together sort of do the same things but do it in a way more privacy yeah, kind of preserving like that. yeah within that i think for for specific publishers you know you, you want to work with a good ad network or good ad partners that is on top of that because it is not yeah. a it, it is there's no question that it is the single largest change to the entire digital ad industry ever um and so it's like while i think that we can come out of this all fine i'm sure there are a lot of people who will not come out of this fine because mm. it's complicated and not you know not trivial to get from from our point a of cookies to point b of this future that we don't fully understand yet yeah, it's, it's like we need to recreate what has been working and what everybody's been relying on for the last 30 years. Most people that are making money online has been relying on for the last 30 years, which is no yep. small feat and it needs to be done yep. within a short period of time. Luckily, yep. Yep. in 2022, 2023, um, start of 2024, we've got a lot of smart people in the space on ad technology and i was going to say before um when i accidentally cut you off was that people come to me and like jared what's what's what happens when these third party cookies you know roll out that there's they're being removed what happens to us as as publishers uh, and my answer was look it's going to be like my i look at it at a, at a high level it's going to be crazy to think that all of the ad networks are going to go out of business because they haven't solved it like that's the, that's mm -hmm. all of you guys' number one priority, right? Is like you want don't mm -hmm. want to go out of business, so you need to solve this problem for advertisers and for you know publishers. So we can freak out about it, but also have some confidence in knowing that you guys are spending all the, a lot of R and D and research in working out how you can solve this. Otherwise, you know, you guys go out of business. Like, and then when you guys go out of business, how does you know how do you because you guys are the middleman which is mm -hmm. such an important thing, not just for publishers. So, hey, we can make money and life's good with our science, but also so advertising can be like, look, like we want to put our products in front of people. Like without you guys, yep. we'd be really, really struggling. If you guys don't yep. work out an answer, how, how are people right. going to make money online um, other than right. just come to my site and hopefully you find it through Google? <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, there is certainly risk there. I, mean, I think the thing that scares people that probably some have seen is that, to use an easy example, when, when Safari got rid of third-party cookies, which which was in 2018, mm. CPMs and RPMs for Safari users went down by like 60%, Whoa. like massive decline. And that has not recovered to this day. And so when you think about that, you're like, well, that's scary. I don't want, what, what, what happens if that happens to everything? And, and now, so what happened there is interesting and it's, it's different than, than what's going to happen in the future. What happened there is most of the budgets got reallocated to Chrome. And we have a ton of data from, the, from 2018 that shows we have, when Firefox made the change and other changes too, where you can see the CPMs in Safari dropping and you can see the CPMs in Chrome rising, like literally in lockstep with each other because the money just got reallocated. Mm. But the question becomes then when Chrome gets rid of them, where does the money go? And so the question yeah. is, do, are we leaned in, are we all leaned in enough to make sure that the money gets reallocated to the web in general to make sure all the great websites with great content get the funding and from ads that they, that they deserve or to advertisers say, eh, forget this. I'm just going to go buy on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Google search, on platforms that are not affected by this change. Is that where the money's going to go to? And that's like sort of the scary thing that none of us, no one knows the answer to. Well, I, when my answer has been and still is, has been in the past and still is now is that you know, they have Google ads, right? They have AdSense, AdSense. So, and Google's going to remove, so like you said, Chrome's eventually, they're 50% of the users uh, online using Chrome. If they're going to remove third-party cookies, how is AdSense going to be a thing, which is one of Google's primary sources of revenue? I dare say Google's not going to just be like, we're going to roll out no cookies for Chrome and we're just going to just die off a big portion of our business. I mean, it could happen, but I, I dare so. I dare say that's why the delay has been pushed out to 2024, yes. so they can go. Let's work out how we can solve this tracking problem in a more private way for AdSense. So there's yep. going to be solutions that you guys and other uh, ad networks can pull from Google. I'm sure. For sure. Yep. Agreed. It's it's a scary thing to think about, but how could one like the big one of the biggest companies in the world just change something without having a solution? 
and when it's a big part of their pie. <laughs> right. On. Exactly. Exactly. I think that that's probably the most confidence boosting thing. Although, you know, does does Google, you know, to, to talk about the sol the solutions, there's a batch of different ones. Yeah. And one of them is something that Google is building called the Privacy Sandbox, which okay. is a which is a batch of within that there's a batch of different technologies that are that are coming out of that. You know, those we're very active working with with Google um, on that set of technologies. Um, if you go to their site, privacysandbox.com, you can see the companies working with them, and we're the only ad network working with them. It's it's a bunch of it's a bunch of big other companies, yeah. um, and so like that's good to be there. But like, does that only solve for AdSense and like the Google part of the world, but not for all the other parts of advertising that exist, mm. which is quite large at this point? Yeah. And so you know, some of those people are thinking about how they work with within that privacy sandbox set of technologies. Others are working on their own technologies and hoping those work. So there's all these different components. So, and that's why we've become so actively engaged in it because I agree with you. I think Google will fix Google's problems, but will Google fix everybody's problems? And that's why I don't think anybody should, you know, rest on their laurels here. Yeah. Cause, and this is what I see is, could be a thing. It's like sometimes when there's a crisis and I'm just thinking about wealth building, sometimes when was the crisis, the rich people get richer and the yep. least affluent people become less affluent. And yep. this could happen in the ecosystem of like where people have, a, as a publisher, has a, a, a small site where they can use and different ad networks to creep their way up to higher RPMs, the more users they have on their site. Whereas those users, when, when this, when the cookies are removed, those users might have to default down to, you know, just using Google AdSense. And then there's might be a big separation between people using Google AdSense and people being able to uh, have a site that is at the level that can be accepted by ad networks such as yourself. And the only reason you can accept those sites is because you need to pay the bills to be able to access the technology to be able to track people in a private way. So there might be a big separation and maybe that's could be an advantage to Google because more people are pushed down to AdSense. So it could, although the, the other interesting, like kind of, so if you, if like one like mega trend in the world right now is privacy, which is driving all these things we're talking about. Another huge mega trend happening right now is regulation. And and Google and others are freaking out about yeah, like the government trying to break them apart yeah. or being sued for this or other problems. And they know that there's a lot of eyes on them and they can't do things that appear anti-competitive. So they're also being extremely if they build something, you know, to use something that is not confidential, um, Within so the privacy sandbox I was talking about actually has government oversight from the UK government. It's a part of the UK government called the Competition and Markets Authority. It's sort of like the regulator in charge of watching Google there. And we talk to them pretty regularly at this point to because we're main testers in that process and try to give them feedback on whatever on that because they're watching to, to really make sure like if, if Google does something that gives them more and more advantages and hurts their competition, which we're not we don't we don't really compete with Google, I would say, because in a, in a funny world like when a user moves from AdSense to us, Google actually makes more money because we work with Google so much on the back end too. So like yeah. we don't really compete with them, um, but they compete with plenty of other companies. And if they do things that advantage themselves and disadvantage others, those government regulators are going to step in and start saying like, this is a real problem. So they, they have very large problems <laughs> that none yeah. of us have that they have to deal yeah. with and think about. Um, yeah. so, so which is why I'm optimistic that what you're presenting like probably wouldn't happen because there's just there's too many eyes watching uh and so for people listening that hate the government sometimes the government's quite good um i actually like i, I just spent a, i spent a portion of time almost just over a month in bali no like almost mm -hmm. no regulations coming back home to australia is like a lot of regulations but life is a lot easier and less stressful yeah. <laughs> there's a balance that can be good for sure yeah yeah Cool, Paul. This has been super enlightening. Thank you so much for for coming on. Uh, it's been great to chat. Where can we send people to find out more about you and what you're doing? Uh, so on adthrive.com, our blog, we try to keep people updated on a lot of things that are going on. We should, we should just put out a whole batch of new blog posts around a lot of the new 
like kind of unique things that that we're doing, um, which is things that I'm doing, but things that like a lot of our teams are doing in terms of like, you know, what our sales team is doing to bring on, you know, custom advertisers that are only work with our platform. What are, we have a business development team that works with like major ad tech companies. And we, we're building a lot of exclusive partnerships there with companies that are only working with us. Um, what our engineering team is building and some of the things they're doing, as well as like, I spend a lot of time on like a bunch of different things, but on like industry standards. So we, myself and a few other people work in like, you know, with the industry trade groups. So like, as we're, as they're building new standards, we're first to adopt them. We're first to roll them out. So we're kind of ahead of the curve on those things. So cool. a lot of those things are documented in our blog. And I feel like there's, there's a batch of good new posts that have gone up pretty recently. Guys, check out Ad Thrive uh, and, and check out what Paul's doing. Be, I'll put links to some of your socials in the show notes. Uh, well, it's Cafe Media, uh, but I'll put Ad Thrive mm-hmm. in there as well. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Paul, thanks so much for, for coming on. Thanks, John. It was great. Appreciate it. For those of you who are listening, please do yourself a favor. If you own a blog, save this podcast episode and re-listen to it in a month's time and pick up on the hidden gems that you may have missed out on. Just like when you read a book for the first time and you pick it up a year later, there's some things that you may have missed out that can hugely benefit you in growing your blog. Also, if you know somebody that has a blog, please do them a massive favor. It's also us a massive favor because we get to help more people and serve more people, Paul and myself and all all of us at Bob here. It helps us serve and also helps you to serve your friends as well. So please share this podcast episode uh, with people that have a blog and a publisher as well. So thanks again, guys. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out. It's an awesome playlist. You'll enjoy it.